a home in heaven, and so do you too. Amen. Uh, it's incredible to worship God this morning. Uh, I'm just really uh, fired up that uh, some of our very own brothers and sisters uh, from the missionary field, uh, we have James and Jennifer Haynes with us worshiping God. Uh, you know, they say true love, you, you can send it off and it comes right back. Today we got our dear sister Lisa Davis with us. And uh, I just want to uh, thank the Coolies for um, reminding us to, to focus uh, on the cross and this communion. I'm so grateful for you guys' friendship. Uh, thank you for, what did the Shea go? I seen her earlier. There she go. <laughs> the Shea men inspired us to, to give back to God and why it's, to, it's about the mission, amen. Uh, again, my name is Tyree Ellison. Uh, I get to lead and serve the mighty Southland region. <laughs> With my incredible, suitable helper, right hand, partner in the gospel, my incredible wife, J.O. Ellison. Amen. You know, this month is the month of sharing is caring. And uh, as kind of been alluded to a little earlier, uh, we must share our lives by opening up our home, uh, practicing hospitality. We must share the gospel to save a lost and dying world. Uh, we must share our resources, our time, our energy, our talent, our finances, our wisdom, our experience. All to meet the needs of the kingdom, to build up the kingdom. But not just here in Southland, all around the world. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, it says, For Christ's love compels us. It, it, it consumes us. It controls us. It's why we do what we do. Because Christ died for you and I sin. And it's the reason why, being in touch with that, it's the reason why it creates a catharsis in our hearts to, to even have the heart desire to share and care for other people. And today, we're going to talk about something a little different. We're going to talk about what stops us from sharing and caring. What stops us as a people of God to fully giving our full hearts to God in the mission. The title I have before us today is to give up everything. To give up everything. You know, in Luke 14, Jesus sent the multitudes of the crowds of people, and they're following him. And everyone wants to be a disciple, want to be a Christian, want to follow Jesus. Some follow for different motives. Some follow for the miracles. Some follow because their needs were being met. They were getting fed by Jesus. And some understood truly he was Lord of their lives. And so they were willing to give up everything. So let's look in the Bible at a time when God's people had the heart and desire to, yeah, at one point share and care and give their full heart and devotion to God. But something stopped them. Something stopped them in their tracks for giving their full hearts to God. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 6. This is a time period where God's people were, at this point, taken into captivity into Babylon. Because of their lack of devotion and full heart devotion to God. And something had cut in on them. At first, they, they just came out of Egypt. God worked this big miracle in their lives. They passed the Red Sea and in the wilderness. And God is taking care of their needs. It meeting every single need. But yet, through the midst of it all, through all the different leaderships and all the transitions in their lives, it's easy to lose focus on what God was truly still trying to teach his people. So they lost sight of it. And then God keeps sending prophet after prophet after prophet, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the so many other men to breathe faith into God's people. However, at this time, during the time of Ezekiel, it was too late. God's people were now taken captive because really they just stopped giving their full hearts to God. And we pick it up here in Ezekiel chapter 6. In verse 1 it says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Set your face against the mountains of Israel. Prophesy against them and say, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the mountains and hills, to the ravens and the valleys. I'm about to bring a sword against you, and I will destroy your high places. Drop down to verse 6. It says, wherever you live, the towns will be laid waste, and the high places demolished, so that your altars will be laid waste and devastated. Your idols smash. Point number one, give up your idols. What stops us from fully giving our hearts to God is the things that we start to put in replace of God, which is our idols. You know, idols, it's anything that takes place of God in your life. It could be anything. 
comfortability can be an idol at the times. Uh, your character aspect, the things you turn to rather than turn to God, your anger, your talents, you can rely on that so much and stop relying on God. The career, you start to put your job before God. You can start putting your family above God, your parents, even your children. And you can start using your children as excuses not to give your full heart to God. You can put your spouse before God and set them up as an idol as well. You start loving them so much, then you love them too much more than God. You can put school above God, your academics above God. You can even start to idolize leading. You see, during this time period, God was calling his people to give up their idols. God actually destroys the idols because God wants to be first. God wants their hearts. God wants their desire. God wants their love. Here in Ezekiel, he's preaching to the Israelites because they lost sight of just that. And so that's why God took them into captivity because of their idolatry. The interesting thing that really caught my attention is in, in this passage was in verse 2, where it says that God uses Ezekiel, the men of God, to prophesy, to preach against the mountains. Like, wait, what? Like, a physical land that's shaped like, you know, the little hill, the little ark. Like, why are you, why are you preaching against this land? You see what I'm saying? And uh, I have to kind of really dive into this a little bit. For most of us, we may know, like, oftentimes physical, uh, the physical uh, aspects of the Old Testament is just physical portion of the New Testament spiritual realities, right? And so the mountains, that, they were really synonymous for kingdoms. Oftentimes during this time period, kingdoms would be set up on high elevation, high altitudes for, for, for protection. And they would build these big walls to protect the cities at this time. But also what was happening amongst the nations at this time is that people will also set up altars in these high places. And oftentimes these altars wasn't worshiping the Jehovah God, but yet they were worshiping like the world around them the idols in their lives. That's why the contemporaries like of Ezekiel's time, like guys like Jeremiah, it says in Jeremiah 3, 6, he talks about Israel has gone up on every high hill and committed sin there. Indicating what? They went up on every high hill to worship the false gods. Whatever God that took, consumed their lives at that point. And at the, one of the popular gods at the time was this Baal worship. And Baal worship was just this, this God of fertility. It was a God of pleasure. It was this God of, of, of our modern day term, you only live once. They call it YOLO. YOLO, you only live once. Hey, you only got one life. Soak as much pleasure as possible. But sadly, due to God's people lack of conviction, the Israelites became so consumed with this mindset and so consumed in their lifestyle, they lost sight of again. You know, in Deuteronomy 7, verse 5, God's standard amidst all of this was always the same. God smashes idols. And this was God's standard even in the time of Ezekiel. God wanted to smash the idolatry in their lives because God wanted to be first. God loved them that much that he was like, what are you thinking? I saved you. I protected you. I provided for your needs. And you put me on the back burner. You consume it, everything else but me. And so God smashes the idols to really get their attention. I don't know. Maybe it's just in the Old Testament. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of more seasoned people here, like, love the Old Testament, you know, old school gospel right there. But it's a lot of young people here. Maybe the God we think about is a God that's just full of grace and full of just uh, forgiveness and full of just, hey, you know what? I know your heart, man. You're okay. Let's see. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Maybe it's just the God of the Old Testament. I don't know. Colossians chapter 3. Again, give up your idols. Colossians chapter 3, you pick it up here in verse 5. It says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And it reminds them. It says, you used to walk in these ways. In your life, you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. 
Put away with this. Kill it off. Crucify it in your sinful nature. And then it goes on to talking about clothing yourself in Christ. What was God's standard? It was always the same. Get rid of your idol. You know, an example of this, because oftentimes in our culture, we try to consume Christianity a lot. We try to market it and package it in a, in a way where it's so, where it's so agreeable. And, and, and you just don't want to hurt people's feelings. You just don't have a standard. You don't have a backbone anymore. You don't take a stand for anything anymore. But that's not the God of the Bible. Look at, look at Jesus' time. Let's go to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we see a woman who is genuine, a woman who really wants to worship God. But was it enough? John chapter 4, we pick it up here in verse 19. It says, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming as now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father and the Spirit and the truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Get rid of your idol. What happened up until this point, the Samaritans long ago, uh, there were a nation of people, and they start to intermarry with the Jews. And at that time, it was a big no-no in God's eyes. Because God wanted his people at this time in the Old Testament to be set apart. But what that ended up happening is this intermarriage and it started to create this new nation, the Samaritans, which were half Jews. And really what ended up happening, not just only the, the family dynamic and everything got contaminated, but sadly, even their beliefs. And as you pan on out, in th throughout the Old Testament, you had the different mountains. One mountain was to represent uh, God pronouncing his blessings, Mount Jerusalem. Then another mountain was to pronounce God's curses. And the Samaritans, they understood that at that time. They're like, well, we want God's blessings. I'm pretty sure we all want God's blessings, amen? So they start to worship on this mountain for years and years and ages and ages, ancestor after ancestor, up until this point, even in the time of Jesus. But sadly, what they don't know is that God was no longer dwelling in the place where they were trying to worship him on that mountain. Now at this time, God has already removed himself, and now he dwells in Jerusalem in the temple. So one may think, well, the good thing is that they were worshiping, right? Like, you can't knock them for that? Yeah. But the not-so-cool part is that, what were they worshiping? If God wasn't there, truly, what was they worshiping? And there's no gray area. You can be like, well, I'm kind of worshiping God. No. Either you are or you're not. Either you're his people or you're not. Either you're set apart or you're not. And so what was she really worshiping? Idols. Idols. You could tell even in her, 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 her speaking, like, you know, you Jews say we got to worship in Jerusalem, which was true at the time. And Jesus knew that. But however, I love Jesus because he's very encouraging here. He's like, you know, a new day is, is coming. You know, this, this, this new way of worshiping is coming. You're no longer going to worship God on a mountain, on a high place. You're no longer going to worship him even in a temple. But God is seeking for true worshipers who are going to worship him in spirit and the truth. And when I see here this morning, I don't see people just worshiping God any type of way. I see a true worshiper, a family of God, who giving their heart to God because they understand that God destroys idols. Because for us, God is first in our lives. You know, God calls us to destroy our idols and worship him entirely. You know, I think about this, uh, this you could YouTube it one day, but uh, it's this uh, YouTube video called The Story of Stuff. You know, and this researcher just does all this, like, research, and you start to see how America and the world is just so materialistic. And it's just a world that's just full of consumerism. And the consumerism just, it's one thing after another, and it's never enough. You just put so many things above so many things and above so many things. It never ends. And it's this whole linear model that they were talking about in the movie that it was never really meant to be that way. And, I, and it was saying, like, that's why it's the, the issue at hand. But you and I know it's not a physical issue. It's a spiritual one. Because the heart of man and woman, we're made to worship. We're created to worship. And sadly, if it's not God, then what is it? It's the idol. 
You know, in the 70s, back in a, a time that uh, I believe it was like the golden years, right? Um, You know, in 1974, I think the, the world known as so much in 1974, they even had People magazine. You start to get so consumed with materialism and marketing and all these different things. Like, you know what? Let's focus on people. Let people be our idols. And here's the thing. If that wasn't enough, in 1977, we got Us magazine. We start, we start focusing on people. Like, you know what? Let's, let's focus on us right here. And here's the thing, if that wasn't enough, in 1979, we got Self Magazine. Oh, forget the people, forget us. You know what? Just me. I'm going to do me, right? And what it shows you is just the world is so consumed with other things, and we live in such an idolatrous society. And what's God's heart? Broken. Hurting. Because the people that he created for his self to worship him and him only, sadly decide to worship other things. You know, for us, God calls us to give up everything. God calls us to destroy the idols in our lives. And here's the thing, like, oftentimes we can idolize our parents growing up, right? Like, okay, it's my parents. I, they're, they're my hero. And then you start to see, like, shortcomings in your parents' lives. And then all of a sudden, like, you know what? My parents are not so, so cool as I thought. You know, and then you start to make choices of your own. You're like, you know what? I'm going to make my own choice. I'm older now. I'm a teen. And as I get older, I can make my own ind independent choices, right? And then for some, they start to turn to drugs and alcohol to numb out the pain from their upbringing and their childhood. And then all of a sudden, you realize that don't work here. It hurts, it hurts you as well because now it's self-harm in that sense. Like, you realize, like, man, that's not it either. So then eventually, guess what? You turn into relationships. Maybe that person is going to love me more than myself. Maybe that person is going to love me more than God. Maybe that boyfriend or that girlfriend is going to love me the way I deserve to be loved. And then you realize real quick that that relationship is not what it is, right? That that relationship hurts you as well. Then all of a sudden it's like, forget it. I'm just going to do me. I'm just going to focus on my career. I'm just going to focus on making money. I'm just going to focus on success and the accolades and the status to be somebody. And then you realize that's not enough. And then one day for some, you decide to have children. And you realize, like, you know what? This little baby never going to hurt me. <laughs> never. Innocent, cute. Look at the little smile. That baby never going to hurt me. But uh, <laughs> until that baby grows up. Then you realize that baby have a mind of its own, and then all of a sudden you want to spend time, and now you're hurt because now the baby has matured and grown up and have their own lives. <laughs> and here's the thing. That happens to a lot of us. And all the times we struggle with it so much because you got to ask yourself, are you so invested in those things? Are you so invested into those things where you become an idol in your life? God wants to challenge you from the scriptures to give it up. You know, my challenge for you guys is that whatever it is that stopped you and your full heart from fully devoting to God, your time, your energy, your money, whatever it may be, that's stopping you from fully giving your heart to God, give it up. Allow God to take reign and be Lord of your lives so you can truly see the impact that he's trying to do through you. God is trying to raise up to be a nation of people that are not just going to evangelize this entire room, but evangelize the world. Are you with me? Yeah. Point number two, give up your identity. Let's go back to Ezekiel in our text. God calls us to give up everything, yes, to give up our idols, but also give up our identity. Because we were always meant to be a people of God. In Ezekiel 8, in verse 5, it says, Then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked, and at the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things that Israelites are doing here. Things that would drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will see things that are even more detestable. Drop down to verse 16. It says, he then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. 
and deer at the entrance to the temple, between the portico and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were bound down to the sun in the east. Idolatry. God calls us to give up our identity. You see, what happens is that when you start to give your full heart to everything that you do, guess what? It becomes who you are. And sadly, guys, people at the time kept giving their heart to things around them rather than God. And guess what? It became who they were. It was their identity now. And identity, what does it mean? It's just the condition our character is as to who you are as a person or the things, right? And so oftentimes at church, a lot of us, we grew up in a religious society. We could, we could fake it till we make it. We know how to do that really well. I mean, that's how a lot of us, most of us probably got jobs. <laughs> right? But uh, we, we, know how to, we know how to play the game. We know. And oftentimes, we know how to play church. Especially if we've been around for a long time. We know the, we know the lingo. We know the things to do but not to do. And we can be self-deceived. But really, behind closed door, you are who you are. And in verse 16, that really caught me is that these guys, sadly, the man, the man was supposed to lead the way. The man's supposed to be the backbone for their families. The man's supposed to take care of God's people. And it says that these guys were in the house of the Lord with their backs toward the temple. They start to put God on the back burner. They put everything up. Before God, except for God, and they put God on the back burner. How does that re- resemble t- for some of our lives? You got to think about it. What, what do you do the most with your time? What consumes your life the most? Is it invested in, like, doing the work of God, taking care of God's people? Yes, yeah, still taking care of your responsibilities. Or is it just too much of busyness and too much respons- responsibilities? We don't have time for God and God's people. You got to ask yourself that. Are you starting to put God on the back burner? You know, and the crazy thing in context of this, this idolatry was happening in the temple, out of all the places. And that's crazy. We all grew up thinking like, okay, in order to have a relationship with God, yes, I got to go to the Bible, but I got to be amongst God's people. People are actually living it out. And so they were hoping that, okay, if I go to the temple at this time, then maybe I'll get the help that I need. And maybe I can have a close relationship with God. Maybe what people will help me get right with God. But sadly, you see the complete opposite. It was so much sin in the temple that people lost sight of God. God was already moved himself from the temple. And it's just idolatry everywhere. And as you continue to read this chapter, it just got worse and worse and worse. And it reminds me so well in, in John chapter 5 with the, with the paralytic. Remember, Jesus tells him, hey, do you want to get well? Do you want to get right? Do you want to change? You've been here for years, man. Do you want to get well? And Jesus later tells him, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Which indicates what? The guy wasn't truly changing at all. He wasn't truly changing. His identity was, man, I'm I'm not able. You know, my conditions, I'm not able. I'm a paralytic. I'm not able. And the same thing spiritually, we could do the same thing. We could be crippled in some areas of our lives. And it's not allowing us to be full devoted to God, and also it doesn't allow us to be at our full potential with God. You know, it's easy to get so focused on ourselves and other things that really don't even matter at the end of the day, honestly, guys. Like, really, it don't. The things we should be focused on is God, the cross, heaven, and the loss, amen? Anything else is just like a cherry on top, to be honest. But we could so much lose our identity and all these other things that's moving around that you don't have no control over. But only thing you could really have control over that stays stagnant and stable is your relationship with God. He's supposed to be the anchor for your soul. You know, let's go to John chapter 3. I think a guy in the Bible really understood this as well. John chapter 3, during the time of John the Baptist, in verse 27, we all know John the Baptist pretty much prepared the way for Jesus. He was a prophet, and um, he was preaching in Judea. And we pick it up here in verse 27. I, I really love this. And verse 27 in John chapter 3, it says, To this John replied, A person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sitting ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. 
That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. He must become greater. I must become less. And then it goes on and it talks a little bit more about Jesus and John the Baptist preparing the way. You know, oftentimes our identity, is, it could be rooted in so many different things. But God is like, dude, you got to become less. Less of you, more of me. Less of whatever you want to do and more of whatever God wants to do in your life. Your identity should be so consumed in Christ. And John understood that. He understood his mission. He understood his task. And he's doing the work of God. But he understood at one point that time was going to end. And then all of a sudden, he must become less. And Jesus and his ministry must become greater. And it's the same message that God was preaching honestly throughout the Bible. So many different men of God, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they understood, like, they were preparing the hearts of God's people. That was the message. It was to prickle the hearts of God's people, leading them up to who? Jesus. And it's the same message I put before you guys. Like, it's still the same scriptures, is it not? <laughs> we still said the same living God, do we not? So the message is still the same. And you don't know how God is going to use you in this time or years from now. You just don't know. But here's the thing, you would never know if your identity is never rooted in Christ. If your identity is just rooted in being a great student and that's it, you fall short. You don't live at your full potential what God is trying to do through you as a Christian. If your identity is only to be, uh, uh, to, to have a great accolade and career so you, can, so you can retire happy with a 401k. Guess what? You missed the mark. God has a bigger plan and a bigger dream for you. But only you, if your identity is rooted in Christ. You know, what I love about our movement is that it actually moves. Uh, God allows things to happen and make things happen. You know, this past Friday, uh, we got some good news uh, that God is doing incredible things. Uh, obviously, throughout this year, trying to plant 27 church plantings, obviously, amen. But we, that means we got to send people to go. We got to share and care. We got to provide the resources to take care of their needs. But also, I really believe God is doing something special here in L.A. You know, uh, a lot of us who are familiar, um, you know, with our church, we have plans. It's good to have a plan. Amen. So we have the crown of thorns plans, which is our, our mission our, and our goal and our prayer goal to evangelize the nations and our generations, not just here in the U.S., but to get, literally get across the whole entire world. But then we also have another plan, Operation Eagle, which is our plan for the U.S. to evangelize all of the United States. But I love this new plan that just came about within the last couple of weeks through a lot of advice and a lot of prayer and a lot of fasting. Because there are needs. And since we're a family, I want to share those things with you. You know, this has been a letter um, sent out by our um, overseeing uh, uh, leader, uh, Dr. Kip McKean, uh, at our World Missions Evangelist. And um, he wrote this letter that I want to disclose to you guys. And it's an awesome news here. It says, Dear family, greetings from New Delhi. For the past few months, the world's sector leaders have prayed all the more fervently that the message of the Lord may be spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Second Thessalonians. Therefore, we have made decisions that would allow God's spirit to do so, such as moving the Ukraine and the Baltic nations into the European world sector, led dynamically by Michael and Michelle Williamson, and placing the remaining 11 former Soviet nations into the new northern Federation World Sector, forcefully led by Dr. John and Emma Kazi. We all familiar with them, amen. The import of this email is to share with you the exciting announcement of the plans for Operation Jerusalem. <laughs> My vision for the Jerusalem Church, which is the LA Church in the movement, has long been Acts 2 41 through 47, which says, Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. In a, uh, baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, sharing is caring, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praise the God and enjoy the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Very interestingly, though all the Jerusalem disciples were sent out by the apostles in Acts 8, by the time Paul reached Jerusalem after this 
third missionary journey, we read in Acts 21, verses 17 through 20, an outstanding fact about the Jerusalem church. It says, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God has done among the Gentiles through this ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed. So amazingly, even through so many being sent out from the Jerusalem church, once again, thousands of disciples were there. Here, doctors Tim and Leanne Kernan have faithfully led the City of Angels Church since December of 2015, the same year I was baptized, actually. During this era of our movement, the Holy Spirit has not sent out many mission teams from L.A., but in fact, whole new world sectors have been planted. At the 2022 GLC, Elena and I gave the charge to our dear son and father, I mean, dear son and daughter in the faith to be a new chancellor couple for ICCM Global so we could devote more time encouraging and strengthening the churches. In this year of the Spirit, the Spirit has moved my heart to see that the leading, the City of Angels Church overseeing the world, uh, the world sector of the tribe and leading ICCM Global is simply too much for one couple, even as gifted as the Kernans. Therefore, we have selected another one of our sons and daughters in the faith to lead the Jerusalem of the movement. Doctors Jason and Sarah Demetri of San Francisco with writing of the Soapy Book Cops, Company of Prophets, and an extraordinary growth in that great church, and in a dream in the Thrive Geographic Sectors, we believe that God's Spirit has set them apart to lead the City of Angels International Christian Church. <laughs> to lead it into a new era of thousands of thousands of disciples, once again, daily baptisms. While still sending out missionaries for the evangelization of the nations in this generation, so please pray and fast over these plans. And the plans reads as this. On Sunday, December 18th, after exactly seven years of gallantly leading the City of Angels Church, Tim and Leanne Kernan will pass on the leadership of the Jerusalem Church to Jason and Sarah Demetri of San Francisco. This will officially begin Operation Jerusalem. <laughs> where 60 plus disciples from San Francisco will move to LA on January 1st, 2023. Tim and Leanne will be freed up to travel and oversee the tribe Pacific Rim World Sector and serve as chancellor couple for ICCM Global. That frees them up to continue to strengthen and encourage all the other churches around the world. The new region leaders for LA in January 2023 are Kyle and Janine Bartholomew of San Francisco. They're going to lead the North region. Adam and Lawrence Zapata is coming back to LA and they're going to lead the Central region. Ole and Regina Ordola in San Francisco, they're going to lead the Southland region. Yeah. Madison Rodriguez in San Francisco will lead the West region. Tyler and Shay Sears, Assistant Future by Stephen Grizzle and Eddie Dunn, all of San Francisco will lead the OC region. Yeah. Austin and Gigi Alexander, who came here from L.A., went off to Hawaii, went to San Francisco, now coming back to L.A., will lead the Mighty Ventura region. Jason and Daniela uh, Woody of Denver will lead the East Region. Rob Jenkins of Salt Lake City will lead the Antelope Valley Region. And in June 23, Nate and Sam Pavone, the valiant leaders of the Oklahoma City Church that planted that church, now will uh, uproot, their families, uproot their families and now lead the mighty South Region. Amen? But there's more. There's more. The new Super Region couples for L.A., the Bartholomews will lead the North Ventura, Antelope Valley, and Santa Barbara regions. The Demetrius will lead the West and Southland region, which is really encouraging because about a couple of years ago, Jason Demetri literally preached in his room and I was here. The Woodies will lead the Central and Eastern AMS region. The Sears will lead Orange County, Inland Empire, South and Coachella Valley. God is doing amazing things, guys, but there's more. The City of Angels Church Shepherding Couples, we all know very well, Tony and Therese Antelon and Michael and Sharon Kirshner will still be remaining here, which is awesome. Dustin and Amanda Miller of San Francisco will step out of the ministry, and they will come here to L.A. to train to become City of Angels uh, Shepherding Couples, helping to unburden the Antelons of all their worldwide shepherding responsibilities. Also moving from Phoenix to L.A. is Jeremy and Amy Cheramella, for Jeremy to serve as the assistant lead cyber evangelist of the International Christian Church. 
the Jabars will be going from San Diego and now taking over the Phoenix Church, amen? But there's more. I'm just saying, God is working powerfully this year, amen? The year of the Spirit. It says the plans for Operation Jerusalem have these paid and hardworking disciples leaving L.A. for their new roles. As many of you guys know, Jackie and Fernando Chavez, who just came from Texas, and now leading the, um, the East region, with the Demetrius coming here to assume the leadership of L.A., well, who's going to fill in that gap? Like, we're a family. We've got to meet the needs of one another. Uh, the spirit will behold it that Fernando and Jackie Chavez will now lead the mighty San Francisco church and oversee the dream churches of California and Utah. And then they'll be taking a team with them, which will include Rico and Janelle Jones, who was here in Southland, and God is still doing incredible things for them, amen. Um, and also, God will call my wife and I as well to go back to San Francisco. JL helped plant the church in 2012. I got baptized there so we can meet the needs of God's people there. Uh, Hugo and Paulina Melendez, Chris and Jessica McClowski, and Nick and Jesse Clyde. Tyler and Talia Youngsma of Houston will also move to San Francisco with 10 disciples. R.D. Baker and Savvy Monflor will soon assume the leadership of the San Diego church and oversee the geographic sector there of the Southwest USA churches. Uh, Brian and Joali Carr will lead the Denver church and now become geographic sector leaders over the Rocky Mountains. Jason and Sarah will directly disciple Joy and Karen Gregory to preferably someday become geographic sector leaders of the Thrive Churches in Texas and Oklahoma. Jose and Monica Carranza over there that was leading the Spanish ministry at first, and uh, they now will be assuming the leadership of the Houston church. And uh, also our very own J.D. and Carla De Leon's, they will now plant the next church pretty soon in Daytona Beach, Florida. Amen? So uh, God is doing incredible things, guys. And after years of faithful service, Ryan and Ayanna, Keenan, and the Petersons will pursue secular appointment just to make sure they're meeting the needs of, of the church here in L.A. And at no point in the history of the Soda movement have there been so many gatherings, as well as so many moves and transitions all at once. Indeed, a new era for the City of Angels Church and for the entire movement will commence on December 18th. And to God be all the glory. We're a family bonded tightly by the Holy Spirit, your dear brother, Kit McKee. God is doing incredible things, guys. And I know, honestly, I know even for me, when it comes to transitions and changes, I mean, I'm human too. It can be difficult. It could be a, it's just tearing away. You, you, you uproot yourself to go somewhere. You give your heart. So you love people. You love people. You love people. You love people. Only sometimes to, to, to tear away. But oftentimes, I think within my last past years, just seven years as a disciple, as I look back, that's been my entire discipleship, to be honest. Uh, constantly changing from ministries and Bible talks and regions and now churches. Um, and for me, I know if... If I get so focused on everything else that I can't control and lose focus on who God says he is from the Bible, that he's sovereign, that he's a great foundation, he's a rock, I could get caught up in the mix. And I start to lose my identity in Christ. You follow me? Jesus called us to see our identity in him, in him alone. He's the anchor for our soul, deeply rooted. And oftentimes I know for myself I could get caught up in those different things where he could become an idol, if you will. Because if this leader leaves, and I'm so caught up in that, did they become something more, than, more to me than God? You know, like, if I'm struggling every time it's a transition, and I'm not saying, like, it's, it's, it's not okay to fail. I think we should fail. And be honest and get open about how we fail. I know this past week, um, I felt a lot, honestly. Um, but I have to fight to even see God in all for myself. You know, um, I'm grateful um, that you guys have loved my wife and I, my daughter. Um, I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to serve and love you guys and build deeper relationships here in L.A. Um, this is not something that just we just sign up for and we check out. Like, that's not never been our heart. We came down here understanding that we're going to fight for our family. And uh, one thing I, I really believe and I want us to really pray about as well is that even though it's this transition, these things that we can't control, we got to understand we signed up to be followers of Jesus. We sign up to be disciples, to give up anything, go anywhere, do anything. It always stayed, been about that. That was God's standard since the beginning. Only what? If our identity is rooted in Christ. 
only if our identity is rooted in Christ, it makes it easier in that sense. However, I know for me, I have to kind of fight to see, like, okay, what's my role in all of this at times? I know we could feel the same, okay, what does that mean for me? Will I still be an intern? Will I still lead? Like, what, what is it? And it's not really about that. Obviously, we understand that, but it's easy to just get caught up in everything, the mixture of things. And I know for me, I have to just keep fighting to pray, keep fasting, keep going to the Bible, understanding who God is from the Bible. Because things change, too. It's, it's the year of the Spirit. One point, it was like 21, 22 churches planned, and now it's 27, which is amazing. But here's the thing. I just want to implore on you guys and encourage you. For most of you guys, this has been your, this has been your prayer goal. This has always been your prayer. Like, man, we always sending out the people after people after people to the point where we're at our bones end. We don't have nothing less to sin. And I believe through all those years of praying to God fervently that God is answering your prayer, South Wind. That they were sending a group of family members, brothers and sisters, willing to uproot their lives just as much as uncomfortable to give their hearts to the mission. To get their hearts to you guys. Not to think that they're better. They're not better. Far from it. But even a lot of them, you see the email threads, all the responses for those guys who are coming. They're like, hey, I'm willing to lay down my life to fight for the faith. And it, and it helped me to think about this scripture as we get ready to close out here in Nehemiah. Because this is truly who we are. We're a family. We take care of each other. We take care of each other's needs. In Nehemiah chapter 4. Here, God's people were going back to rebuild Jerusalem. In Southland, we got to commend ourselves. L.A. got to commend ourselves. We sent so many people to change the world. That's how I got baptized, because of you guys' faith. Because of you guys' faith. And it's awesome to see people pouring that back into you guys because of your faith. But it's a scripture I want to just press upon your hearts. In Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, it says, Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the Lord's points of the wall at the exposed places, posted them by families with their swords and spears and bows. After looking things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your families. <laughs> Just fight for your families. Have your identity rooted in Christ. That's the only way you're going to make it. I want to put before you, give your hearts when they come. Because they're coming to give their whole heart. To lay down their lives for us. Give your hearts like you did with JL and I. Receive them warmly like you did with us. Because honestly, that's what made a difference for us when we wanted to give up. Give your hearts to the leadership. Don't get caught up in, like, all the things you can't control. Here's the thing. You can't control it. And it gets so consuming, you can lose your identity in this. How many people we see walk away from that? Hundreds. Let that not be said of you guys. And I don't believe that's your heart. Because I believe those in this room, we're fighters. We're scrappy because we love God and love his people. Because our identity is rooted in Christ. Family, I want to challenge us to give our heart fully to God and his people. You know, if this is going to be a month where we truly share and care for other people, let it be a month where we decide to destroy our idols in our lives. So we can be the men and women that God raises up to do incredible things in this world. And let us find our identity in God every single day and fight for our family with that, guys. I love you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>